All right, my dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure for me to speak today at the Horizons, Horizons Forum once again. So, and um, uh, thank you for the organizers for to organizing the, the, this great event where we have the opportunity to speak worldwide about the burning issues of the world. And uh, people actually are yearning to get to get questions to get answers to the burning questions. And uh, the organizers managed to invite so many cognoscenti and people knowing uh, some answers. So, therefore. This wonderful platform that we're, that we're using right now gives us an excellent opportunity to, to ventilate our different solutions that we have, finding the, for finding the best possible solutions that we might have. So today, uh, I'm having here among my guests, uh, Alfred Checker, founder and chief executive officer of the United States of America. I'm also hoping that we shall have Ahmed Bowser, advisory board member of Swire Coca-Cola Hong Kong. We have uh, Nick Lovegrove, professor of the practice of management, McDonald's School of Business, United States of America. We also have fame name, founder, Ish Opportunity, United States of America. And uh, I hope also that we shall have Ernesto Nunez, Chief Executive Officer for all Mexico. So these are the people who are invited to be speakers at today's session. And uh, today we're going to speak about disruption and opportunity. And uh, it seems to be a very general sort of question raised by the organizers. But I'm sure each one of us have different aspects and different ways to see these, these two most important notions of the 21st century and uh, providing, an providing answers to these questions. So first of all, colleagues, with your permission, I will give my vision of uh, how these two notions are related to each other and how uh, people in, modern, in the modern world understand them. And then you will just share your vision about, your, uh, about these two notions and whether you agree with me or disagree with me. Well, first of all, I'll begin with disruption. Somehow this word becomes a sort of a fashionable words of today, not so much a word of great meaning, but a word of fashion, I think. And the word disruption, from my point of view, is not just innovation, but disruption is an innovation that changes our lives drastically. And um, well, I would say that, honestly, I'm not prepared for drastic changes in my life. And when somebody is speaking about disruption in my life, I become to a certain, uh, I become to a certain extent scared, actually, of that, because disruption may actually break completely the whole of my life. And therefore, when somebody, some businesses and so on and so forth, starts telling people that they are uh, after disruption, uh, I begin to be very, very cautious about that. Uh, therefore, uh, this cautiousness, this fear of sudden unexpected changes in our lives, I think it is mostly for the young generation, for the generation that is coming, that, is, that thinks very boldly about what may come in the near future. Therefore, when people are raising the question of disruption, they're mostly talking about young generation, about the new generation that is going to conquer the future world, uh, while the old generation would not be so bold, probably. So, uh, Albert Checker, what do you think about, uh, about what I've said right now? Do you think that we, that we really need disruption in the current world and, the, and that the old world is getting so already unusable that we do need a disruption and uh, mm -hmm. think of turning it into opportunity? What are your thoughts about that? Good, very good points. I think there is a lot of uh, correlation between disruption and disturbing somebody. So like, I think that's what you're underlying here. And I agree with that. But at the same time, what I'm thinking is, you know, coming from... Uh, trying to be new, innovative, I realized that you can't innovate for everybody at the same time. So there's always the newcomers. And in this case, a lot of times that's going to be the newer generation. So they'll adopt things earlier. Like I remember setting up VCR when they first came out for my parents because he didn't want to deal with it. It was just another thing that you need to, you need to deal with. But, you know, as, a, as the young generation, I was in charge of making sure that we can record something. But eventually my father was also like somebody who was, using the VCR a lot. So I think it starts really with the younger generation, the early adapters. It may be anything, you know, like it may be the product managers, it may be the marketers, it may be the end user, but there's always a first adapter. And as uh, if you're aiming to disrupt something, uh, which I think it's just an additional notion, as you were mentioning, uh, that is uh, in tandem with innovation, it, you're really targeting, you're gonna, you're gonna first find your, early adapters and see if you can find some, some sort of product market fit there. If it, right. that happens, there's a good chance that that can expand and turn into a wildfire from there on. But it, like trying to 
capture everybody at the same time probably is a very hard uh, endeavor to start with. So like, it's probably a good idea to figure out, okay, who would be a good first target to test this idea and then, then see if it catches up from there on. Right, right. Now, Professor Lovegrove, I know, I know that you are here, but something is wrong with your camera. But uh, actually, I would like to ask, to ask you a question. You are, uh, you are a professor of the practice of management in the McDonald's School of Business from the United States of America. And management is something that requires a certain stability in business, right? We need stability. And therefore, when people are talking about disruption, it also, needs, uh, it also requires um, great changes in the management. New people are coming. New changes appear. People start working in the distance mode. Uh, what, how, what are you te- teaching uh, uh, at your school in the age of disruption? And uh, how seriously it actually affects the old practices and uh, how reliable, from your point of view, are the new practices of management in the era of disruption that, may, that should be turned into opportunity? What do you think about well, it? Well, th- thank you. And, and I'm sorry you can't see me. There's a problem with the camera. But I can hear you and, and see you all. And it's a pleasure to join you. Um, you know, I, um, I, I am a professor of management now at Georgetown University, but I spent most of my career as a management consultant with McKinsey and Company. Uh, I spent more than 30 years there in London and in, here in uh, the US. So I've seen uh, from that vantage point the, the degree of change and disruption there's been during that era, that 35, 40-year period. And obviously, the primary driver of that disruption has been technology. And sometimes when I reflect upon the changes in technology that have happened during that period, and I list them, and I worked on many of them from a business standpoint, you know, they're pretty extraordinary, you know, including, of course, and up to uh, the the technology that we're using now that would have been unthinkable uh, uh, even a a few uh, years ago. Um, And so clearly, you know, it's been important to reflect upon that and understand the uh, impact that technology has had on our world. But I would say, to answer your question directly, that the nature of what is taught in today's business schools, uh, I think, around the world is remarkably similar to what was taught uh, when I was a business school student in 1984 at INSEAD in France. I, I, the curriculum is very, very similar, and I think it has proved quite difficult for business schools to Uh, change and adapt to these disruptive forces. Um, I do see some evidence of them doing so now, and I think the biggest change is in the uh, the arena of analytics. I think the desire in almost every sphere um, of management life to kind of prove a hypothesis with data uh, and the availability of increasingly robust quantities and qualities of data are changing the mindset away from, you know, um, a, a somewhat uh, fuzzy approach to management to a more analytically disciplined approach, an evidence-based approach, if you like. So that's where I see the biggest uh, change underway. Mm. You know, uh, well, people from academia, from academia are always very good about recommending different sources for further for further development uh, in, the, in this difficult world. Therefore, I would say, what are... The, the sources uh, on your table, like books or maybe some other works that you would recommend to other people to just to, to get acquainted with and maybe use as a guidance uh, in, in, in business and also in their daily life because we're, we're, we're actually entering very actively increasingly into, into a new world of technology that un, uh, unseen before, unheard of before, and uh, we don't really know how comfortable we would be, would be there. Uh, what would you recommend as a, as a sort of an inspirational guide to read and to well, further use in our lives? I think the whole literature around behavioral economics, um, uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Stavarsky, um, is has reshaped people's approach to thinking about uh, decision-making, biases, prejudices that filter into our working lives. Um, there's a, a book just out a few weeks ago called Noise that relates to aspects of that. Um, and I think also the, uh, you know, relatedly, the geopolitics of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and climate change technology both, um, and the contest between particularly the US and China, which China is winning, to um, lead in those arenas is going to certainly evoke substantial 
challenges right. for Western businesses. So I think those two parallel sort of the, the, the theatre of the mind, if you like, and the prejudices and biases that we're dealing with, which are now informed by increasingly concrete data and the geopolitics of um, uh, technological uh, development in addressing our contemporary challenges. Those strike me as two big areas of literature. Right. Well, thank you. Well, this is, this is most useful. And certainly we just, uh, this, this is going to be a very useful, well, this discussion is going to be a very useful material for your students as well, because they would know what you're reading and uh, what would you recommend them for their further development. Thank you so much. We shall return to this issue and to, 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 to this question again later on. Uh, I was thinking also about uh, the following question, whether uh, disruption that is happening in the modern world and opportunities that are growing with that is a sort of a black swan that Nassim Taleb was writing about. Fahim, uh, Fahim Naim, do, you, are, you are the founder of a, of a company that has the word opportunity in itself, it's each opportunity in the United States of America. Do you believe that uh, the changes that are actually happening, happening in, the, in the world today uh, and the good sides of these changes and the bad sides of these changes uh, may be considered as, as a black swan, really, in the sense that Nassim Taleb was, was, was always speaking about or is it something that could be expected and we should be moving along these lines as something quite predictable and therefore quite manageable? What do you think about that? Yeah, th thank you for that. Sorry if uh, you hear a little bit of echo, my Bluetooth headphones aren't working, but we will uh, manage through the disruption of my, uh, my ear devices. Um, so great, great question. A um, little bit of background, each opportunities and e-commerce um, we manage a number of large and emerging brands, e-commerce presence. And I think it's a great e-commerce generally has been, um, has gone through a ton of disruption, if we want to call it that, over the last decade, particularly in the last year, especially in a COVID world. I think there's a lot of parallels to what has happened in the e-commerce industry over the past um, year. For example, when COVID first hit, um, it was, it was very unclear how bad e-commerce would be impacted. So it ended up being um, hindsight 2020 e-commerce has really taken off for a number of different reasons, convenience and safety and some of those things. But when it was happening, it was a ton of disruption happening um, on supply chain. Brands couldn't bring their inventory um, domestically. The warehouses were closed. There was a ton of transportation issues. Amazon specifically had a number of issues um, in their warehouses, um, pricing, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it was a great example of an industry that for a while, it seemed like it, it was, it was going to take a real hit. And at the end of the day, I think there was a number of different things that many of the e-commerce brands and retailers did during that period to manage to disrupt this, uh, the disruption and, and, and make it make out in a, in a positive way. Um, for example, Amazon, unheard of. They're, they're known, at least in the U.S., for having one or two-day delivery. They made the decision to have extended deliveries. You order something, they were showing four-week delivery times when the inventory was at Amazon. And this pissed off brands. There was a ton of questions from customers on why am I shopping on this platform? It's taking so long. That gave them enough time to beef up their warehouse presence, add the safety protocols necessary to really upscale. Uh, and you've seen the numbers. They've, they've had phenomenal growth and they're well positioned in the future because they made a tough decision that had a, a bunch of backlash at the time to, to purposely slow down delivery and prioritize which products were going to come out. And uh, to me, that's what disruption is. Disruption is about making difficult choices and, and going through and learning as you go and oftentimes in the moment will feel like you're failing or you made the wrong decision, but you're making a big gamble because you're, you're willing to take a calculated risk. Uh, and, I, and that's exactly what disruption is to me. It sounds like a sexy word that people say it's, it's fun to fail and all these different things. I used to live in the Bay Area. People talk about all the time. But when it comes down to it is are you, are you willing to make those tough decisions and learn and be agile and continue to adjust your business model? And chances are whatever you learn now will not work in six months from now. So are you up for that challenge and going to continue to um, innovate and respond to that challenge? Or are you going to complain that it's disrupted the, the core of your business model that you built your business on over the last decade?
in, in this sense, if I understand you correctly, so your, your, your vision of the word disruption or the notion of disruption is absolutely different from what Professor Lovegrove here expressed because you are more on the, you, you're more on just putting together the word disruption and opportunity. For you, disruption is a, is a smart way of dealing with opportunity and uh, being very fast and efficient and effective in actually dealing with opportunity. Therefore, you are always on the alert, looking around, seeing the moment the opportunity comes your way, you are quick in the, in the uptake in growing and in, in developing further on. That's how you understand it. Well, Professor Lovegrove is thinking more about new technologies. So Professor Lovegrove was, speak, was speaking about the world of disruption as the world of new technologies. It is highly important. And in this sense, uh, there is a great question that I wanted to ask uh, you, Ahmed Boza, who is the advisory board member of Swai Coca-Cola Hong Kong. You know, uh, my question uh, is actually at the, at, the, at, the, at the core of the whole business, which is value. The notion of value and uh, how it is understood by the world, and we know what value, what, what value investment is. And uh, when a certain company exists for a long time, like Coca-Cola, for example, right, or other companies like, like that, they have a certain vision of themselves. They have a certain understanding of value they deliver to people, to the markets. And the market is actually, well, uh, it, is, uh, it is expected that it, 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 sh it should be stable for a long while and it, it should not be changing all the time. How do you think the notion of value for business changing today? And should the companies be really very, uh, very concentrated and focused on rethinking and reconsidering the value that have been traditional for them for many, many years on. And uh, the word disruption and value, from my point of view, are to a certain extent antonymic because value is something more or less stable, well put, well established. Well, disruption has in itself the notion of destruction, actually. It's, it destroys something to such an extent that you need to reconsider the notion of value at all. What's your vision of that? Thanks, Mark, and my apologies for the slight uh, delay in my uh, joining. Um, you know, I, when I think about uh, the change that uh, we experience, whether it's as big and involved as the combination of, you know, exponential technologies and COVID, COVID what that had done to us, it just accelerated a lot of things, even if it is something like that. Um, whatever we talk about are things that don't change. And there are things that do change. Okay. So for value, um, I think what doesn't change is the requirement that uh, a business is focused on creating value for all of its stakeholders. Or, you know, or it has a sort of an enlightened sense of self-interest, which says that for me to create value for myself over a longer time period, I have to create value for the different stakeholders that are critical to my system. Um, that, of course, requires a very long-term view. You know, you have to sort of assume that business is a going concern. And um, uh, that sense of self-interest can sometimes be impacted by short-term considerations. Uh, but that doesn't change. So in, in today's world, with the change and the disruption, the fact that value creation in companies have to be thought of with what I call an enlightened sense of self-interest. Hmm. That shouldn't change. That should be the same. That should be our anchor. Um, but what does change is, um, you know, what this disruption does to us. Like, I'd like to th think about COVID and technology sort of in the same vein because the technological change at no point in time in the history of humankind have we seen so many technologies you know, exponentially growing at the same time, converging, hundreds of billions of dollars being invested in them for commercialization, millions of people working on them. It's crazy. So there is, you know, that sort of defines the speed at which our lives are changing and will change. And then COVID comes. It just adds a top spin to that. Uh, I'm also a board member of, of an e-commerce company. I, I share Fahim's comments. Uh, I, I think, you know, for that industry, this was a tailwind because it accelerated the future we were going into. Now, when, when you're caught in a wave of change like that, um, 
I don't think there's any difference between humans, organizations, countries. If you're caught strongly for that change, you will convert that disruption into opportunity. But if you're caught weakly, you'll probably die. The same thing happened in, in COVID. If, if, if your overall health was bad, you were more likely to not survive if you contracted the, the virus. And I, I think the same thing applies here. So I think the way we think about that strength defines how the organizations can um, redefine value or how they can create the value. And the way I think about that is there, again, in there, there are things that don't change. And then there's the new world. If you weren't good in things that don't change, there is no way you can properly respond to the requirements of the change around you. Yeah. So for you to create value, uh, you have to strengthen on those fundamentals, which I count as, well, a simple thing as cash and balance sheet. Like if, <laughs> if you were an airline and you did not have a strong balance sheet and if your government didn't save you, That'll be at your end. But that's such a basic thing. But on a more uh, intrinsic level, it's the organizational capability of your organization. Uh, It's the leadership. It's the culture. How how well you can innovate, how agile you are, how good of an executor are you. So those are some basic fundamentals. They will be always important. But then because – so if if you were already weak in those – you're really not going to get to the future. So you have to play a game of catch up and adaptation at the same time. And, uh, and that's tough. That's tough. And that's probably the <laughs> uh, law of nature that um, only, only a select few will get through those. Um, I, I don't want to talk too long. And, and uh, so maybe I could spare my comments about you know, how to deal with the change, especially for old economy companies. And also I have a point of view on, on the new economy companies, how to deal with this change in a way to create value. Uh, I could spare that for, for the next round, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ahmed, uh, you, were speaking, you were speaking about the future. And uh, definitely when, uh, when a business is developing and is, 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 is thinking about sustainability, uh, at the same time, thinking about what to do in the in the, disrupt, in the new disruptive world, uh, but we should also remember that actually, uh, future does not exist, right? Future does not exist. There is no future, right, at this very moment. And the future is something that we actually create now at this very moment. And future is, uh, as uh, uh, Fahim Naim said, is the opportunity to, to the opportunity immediately. So you, your, your ability to see clearly what is happening around you. And create create the future on the spur of the moment. Uh, in this sense, I'm, I want to ask Professor Lamgro. Uh, well, thinking about the future, well, from from your point of view, can we create uh, sustainable economics in the current disruptive world, where the word disruption in itself contains so much unpredictability about the future? Sorry to be so complicated, but if you understand what I'm, te- what, what I'm telling about, meaning how sure can we be about the so-called future uh, in the periods of the disruptive world? Or should we be very, very cautious about, uh, about stating where we're going to? What do you think about that, Professor Lovell? Well, let's, uh, let's address that question in the context of what's happened over the last 18 months, the COVID-19 crisis, because... I would then suggest no company in the world had a disruption so significant as that in its business plan or even in its expectations of plausible, of what was plausible. Um, so they have had to respond to the not only the unpredictable but the unpredicted. Uh, and uh, and um, I think we can take some measure of confidence that most model organizations have been able to respond quite quickly after all. By and large, um, the world has continued to function. Um, economies have continued to um, uh, form um, uh, reasonably uh, within those within those circumstances. I, I think I saw statistics that global trade was down four or five percent in 2020, not 40 or 50 percent, but four or five percent. Um, uh, we're now seeing in the U.S. a pretty rapid return to um, 
a fairly normal functioning of business that's not quite yet fully back to where we were 18 months ago, but not far off. Um, that has proved a, a degree of adaptability and resilience in um, our global business system. Uh, there are various explanations to why that might be. And one of them, of course, goes back to our, our earlier discussion about technology. It is that um, uh, the one thing that has been relatively undisrupted um, has been the digital system that enables much of our activity to go on, including these kinds of conversations, but also including the handling of goods and services. Um, so in a, to some degree, we've taken people out of the equation, people with all their vulnerabilities out of the equation. That has given us a certain degree of resilience. I nevertheless think that this has occasioned us to think quite hard about some of the um, dimensions of modern business that maybe have uh, exacerbated our vulnerability, the, the just-in-time supply chain kind of concept, the, the need to um, the low inventory uh, uh, idea that uh, the, the hyper efficiency, if you like, of the last uh, 20 years. Um, and that will probably be modified, at least as people sort of realize, yeah, we can't be, we can't allow ourselves to be completely exposed. Um, mm. anyway, some of the, some of the sort of challenges that we've had to deal with. So in a sense, we've had an experiment in exactly what you're talking about. We by and large survived the experiment. We probably learned quite a lot in the process. Um, and uh, everybody will now build that into their thinking going forward, just as to some degree every bank had to change its whole think its thinking after the 2009 financial crisis. These crises are kind of to some degree wake-up moments that require you to, cha to think and change. Right. What, what, what you're saying is, is very, 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 very interesting. I will return with, with, with additional question to you later on because I it just you actually pushed me to, to think about something. <laughs> let me remind me. Uh, let, let me remind our listeners that uh, now we had an opinion from professor of the practice of management from the School of Business, United States of America. Uh, but while talking about the future and disruptions and opportunities, I'm also thinking about markets and how pace of the current markets is changing. Whether it is a relatively stable area, or whether it is something uh, quite actively changing. You know, um, Albert Shakir, I was uh, I was I was going to ask you about uh, about your vision of, of the market as as they exist right now. You know, I'm extremely surprised by sudden and actually very often unpredictable and uncontrollable growth of startups all around the world. And uh, if, for example, in the previous years, uh, like students of universities and uh, and schools were thinking about actually earning their first money only after or graduating and working for some time and only starting starting growing. Today, almost every second teenager is thinking uh, is thinking about starting just starting their own enterprise and uh, and offering their own value to the world. And this definitely, from my point of view, this uh, this actually transforms the face of the current market for all of us and in different locations. Aren't you scared of this sudden and very often uncontrollable face of the market where you need to, do, where you, where you need to adapt to this market? And in this point of view, from this point of view, you need to be disruptive because the market is making you to be disruptive. What do you think of that? I'll bet you can. I, I, I actually welcome that. I am, I'm really uh, fond of all that, all that is brought to the table by, by those people. A lot of them are going to fail, and that's probably okay. One, it's a great talent pool. Because whatever they learn from their own experience is probably better than what they would learn from the large organization on their own. So that's useful for the next generation of uh, companies to come to life to start with. And they're also, you know, they use things, right? So like they're also usually a potential customer or client for a lot of other people. So they, they create opportunity for all those as well. And the information just starts, uh, circulating faster and, and 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 to a greater degree as well and that's actually very useful for the whole market as well having said that you know a lot of times you know there's there's a lot of value just being you know uh, i'm coming from a culture where apprenticeship is valued a lot and that is kind of diminished in that mentality seeing that like wow. no i'll go just go get it right but Absolutely. there's actually value in in staying behind learning the trade and understanding the ins and outs, and then go from there on. 
So, but that's 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 I think that the art of this is where the art of disruption comes from. So uh, I I agree that the, the it's all turning into being a game of numbers. So you can really uh, try to understand things through numbers and math. But at the same time, I think disruption is also a game of like stepping back and mm-hmm. at some point actually forgetting what you know and trying to see it from a different angle. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the typical example in startup world is, you know, if people, if I ask people, they would say that they need faster horses. Uh, but you've got to always have the option to ask people, why do you need fast horses? And that answer is actually that the thing that leads to disruption. Then you can say, well, they want to get to A from A to B more comfortably, faster, more conveniently. So like now you, that's your opportunity where you can go and like maybe do something that has not been done before. So going back to the problem always actually leads to a better solution if you are willing to take that bet. As, as it has been mentioned before. Uh, but going back to your original question, I think you know people coming in earlier in the market with their own ideas, with their takes, challenges all of us. Uh, and that's a good thing. Sometimes you know that you become they become a part of your journey and sometimes you become a part of their journey. And in either case, the journey gets more rich. Yeah, this, this, the, the interesting point that you are making, and in this sense, oh, well, thank you very much, Albert Shikir. But in this sense, I want to ask you, uh, the, the following question. You know, when you, you are speaking about the opportunities that you need to chase on your way all the time and be be on the lookout for new opportunities to appear very often, but in the in the world in, in the situation when uh, where everyone is looking for for new opportunities, don't you think that it will be uh, to, it will be very destructive, actually, along the ways, because, uh, because you, you may you may be looking for excellent opportunities now that may change uh, in the next minute uh, they, and may completely change your strategy and your vision of your own business, and you may suddenly switch from one market to another market. What do you think about the value of partnerships in this world, where everyone is getting is to be very very jealous about each other and trying to be as fast as they can? Hey, great question. Um, and going back to just add to something to um, Alper's comment, um, I think the interesting thing about startups, 90% of them fail, but it's about how they adjust. So the famous story is YouTube. YouTube actually started off as a dating site. They wanted to upload video dating profiles and they adjusted their strategy and they figured out what customers wanted. So I think to more directly answer your question, I think Ideas don't necessarily matter as much as execution and pivoting and finding that perfect product market fit. And there's a number of on paper amazing ideas out there. Um, and I think it's not a bad thing that everybody has their own idea and everybody wants to be the next Facebook and everybody's trying to build the next biggest thing because the, the, the devil's in the details and how you're adjusting and how you implement and how do you pivot and how do you get those users and why are the users not returning to your site? So I think that's where most of the um, value add actually comes from, less on, on the story side. So that's somewhat answering the, the, the question. In terms of partnerships, I think partnerships, both formally and informally, are obviously um, extremely impactful. Um, I think sometimes when you're launching in a different country, there's obviously a ton of value add in having a local partner that understands the the norms and not underestimating what that requires. But I think even in a non-traditional sense, partners, informal partners, mentors, business case studies, other people in the industry, oftentimes reaching out to somebody that has gone through something similar, um, that I've I've talked to hundreds, uh, maybe thousands of founders and CEOs of startups over time. And the one common trait is many of them sought out help and they sought out people to learn from. And again, sometimes they're formal relationships. Sometimes it's um, they reached out to a company they really admired and they wanted to see how they pivoted. So I think that um, that is where a lot of that value creation again is going to happen on that. That person who is relentless that actually wants to not just come up with the perfect idea on paper and say that it needs to stick, but it's going to continue to dedicate their their life and soul to make it happen. And that's where partnerships, again, uh, in, in both senses, can be very um, powerful. If that answers the question a little more directly. Thank you so much. I'm Naeem, founder of Wish Opportunity in the United States of America. Uh, uh, my question to you, Ahmed Boza, uh, if... Um, uh, well, I have a, I've always a feeling that when we move to lockdown, for nearly two years and even more, 
there was a sort of a fake internationalization of business, meaning people started communicating with each other more often and sharing and exchanging ideas more often and technologies more often. But don't you think that with borders closed and with countries more or less increasingly distancing from each other, the business is actually becoming not increasingly international, but decreasingly international. And, uh, and this uh, fake international character of business communication interaction in the, in the world of disruption is one of the biggest disruptions in the world where you, where you become increasingly local and you need to, to, to think more locally rather, rather than globally in this, uh, in this new world. What do you think of that? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, if I may, I, I just want to add two sentences to the previous question, uh, whether it's good or bad, the number of startups, etc. I, I feel it's, uh, it's a requirement of our times. You know, the, the companies consolidating ever more, they're doing productivity exercises. There are less and less opportunities for people to move up. Um, you know, the career time spans were much longer in a given company. They are not there anymore. So society has to sort of find its way. And where that is that going to come from with more entrepreneurship, more startups? And unfortunately, yeah, as you say, 90% percent with them, but that's not as unfortunate as uh, Fahim and Antar uh, has mentioned. So just wanted to add that. Um, in terms of internationalization, uh, Martin, I, I don't know. You're absolutely right about the trend. Um, you know, it started maybe with the, uh, uh, you know, U.S.-China uh, trade wars. Um, I mean, even today, the businesses here are suffering Uh, from extremely high transportation costs because uh, because of things driven by uh, by that trade war. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to read that as a sort of a, a constant trend that the world is going to become a lot less internationalized or is this something temporary? You know, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, having worked for a global company for so long, uh, my my default mode of thinking says... <laughs> Um, this will sort of settle in. Uh, I think, uh, you know, U.S. thought that China was getting too much of a good deal. So there was an adjustment that was needed. And then some things have started. And, and uh, I think this, this world has tasted uh, the, the global um, business, the way of global working. I think it's, it's uh, very difficult to sort of go back to the world where, you know, everybody's out there for themselves. The borders are closed. I don't think it's going to be such a major change. Plus, as you say, um, you know, we used to do um, this this thing called pest analysis. You know, when you look at a country, uh, when you you know plan for the for that country, what's the political, economic, social, and technological developments? And for all my career, what drove the activity was the economic. You know, all the, the liberal economy from the Reagan-Thatcher era, it took us all the way to the end of 2008, 9, 10, and, and we got a bit of disruption. I think E is leaving its way to the T. And then as E, uh, as, as technology now is the main driving force, how technology does globalization, how it impacts globalization becomes important. And I think that's positive. Uh, so people can work from anywhere. I mean, I, I hear Facebook can find programs from all around the world and they can stay where they are. Okay, it's that's globalization. People might not well, can have... I, can I suggest, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to make a suggestion that relates to that, and that is that it's it's become kind of T divided by P, or at least, or at least offset by P. <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> Uh, <laughs> the, technology, the technology is inexorably global. I mean, it clearly it can connect you wherever and it can make the world a very small place, as, as these kind of <laughs> calls suggest. But the, the P is the, is the denominator. It's the, it's, the, it's the complication. Politics. Absolutely. And politics Absolutely. has clearly pivoted in the direction of local and, um, and, and is dividing. You know, obviously the country where I come from, the UK, has declared its sort of uh, divorce from Europe, um, even within Europe, there's sort of reasonably, you know, some distinctions. And clearly the, ge the geopolitical divide between the US and China, the US and Russia, you know, are, they, you know, are fundamentally different than they were 30 years ago when we all felt like we were on the glide path towards a single global market. That seems pretty fundamental and, as I say, offsets the technological impact.
Thank you. No, we, we, have, we have barely five minutes left. Therefore, well, Ahmed, I will let you finish, and then I will have one more question before we, before we finish. Yeah, yeah. To ask the first yeah. yeah, okay. I mean, I, I certainly hear that, and, and I like the word divided by P, because in the previous era, I think it was economics multiplied by P. Now technology right. divided by P. I, I think that's a good way to say it. But I still say that, you know, people here in the U.S., for example, they find ways of producing locally. Okay, they adapt, adjust. Now, uh, okay, that does have an impact on the overall global trade and everything, but fundamentally, is that going to lead us to a more uh, local world? Or may maybe it'll be an adjustment, but who knows? Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. So um, that's what I was going to say. That's how I was going to conclude it anyway. And uh, let me just uh, pass the ball to you, Martin. Thank you. Well, I have, we have barely four minutes left, therefore I'll have very, the very, very last question, unfortunately, we need to, to round off. Uh, Professor Lovegrove, my, my question is the following. Uh, well, speaking about management in the new world, we have the so-called classical, uh, beautiful, standard uh, way of management where companies exist as, as self-containing units. Uh, while on the other hand, we have, this, we have the so-called crowd management, and very many decisions are made by crowds in this world. We have bloggers, we have, we have social networking, and so on and so forth. But do, well, don't you think that we all find balance in this kind of management, you know, the crowd world, world of more or less unpredictable management that's happening in the world. On the other hand, there is a very classical type of management which uh, which allows us to move steadily on. What do you think about that? We have barely three minutes left, therefore, please be very short. Well, well I'll just I'll just um, agree with your hypothesis and, and again, you know, try to draw a lesson from the last 18 months with the response to COVID. You know, the, the vaccine development has clearly been a fortunate uh, interaction between a relatively amorphous academic research and development effort, primary research into mRNA technology, and the sort of uh, uh, almost brute force of large corporate uh, organizations, Pfizer uh, in particular, uh, AstraZeneca to some degree. And that is, it's fortunate that that has happened. Otherwise, we would be in a much different, much worse place now than we, uh, even than we are. Um, and, and, and I think that's to some degree you know, been true of uh, the technology sometimes been true of the entertainment industry, um, you know, the, the desire for people to do their own thing, but to do their own thing within with the confidence that they'll be able to get to scale reasonably quickly uh, seems to be a sort of fun. Thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lovegrove. So, uh, unfortunately, we have so little time to discuss these things, and all of you colleagues are very, very interesting people with very, very interesting views. And I would, uh, I would dream of continuing this discussion one day. So, we have your emails, and one day probably we shall get together to discuss things in a more detailed manner. But, uh, but as of now, I would like to thank you all for participating in this wonderful discussion. That was, that was very dynamic, very fast, very efficient. I think we worked as one team. And uh, we've come up to certain conclusions, but I can't think of, of providing some sort of a bulleted list of solutions that we, that we, that we provide. And so therefore, I leave it to, to Frank Richter, actually, to, to come up with certain solutions and, uh, and present it to the audience. So now each one of you may have one very brief word to our audiences, so that they would, uh, if you have something to wish or something to just to advise to them, we have just barely two minutes. One word for each one of you. Um, for him, maybe we'll say a couple of words, and then I will pass the word to each one. Uh, I'll keep it brief because I don't have much more to add. Before um, that's different than what I said before, but and I think the my, my point of my lesson is um, treat disruption as an uh, opportunity. I think is the way you put it. Um, there will con continuously be different challenges thrown out, and it's the responsibility of business leaders to, to focus on the solution and not the problem. And that's that's what we get paid the big bucks for, uh, so to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> what, what, what do you think? Well, what would be your advice? Uh, I think there's also, I think I would probably add a, just one sentence uh, stating that disruption also includes some sort of art in it as well. So like sometimes stepping away and like going upstream, even if it doesn't make sense, and, and if you can be persistent about it, may actually yield good results as well. So it's really a stubborn game to play as well. Thank you so much. Ahmed Boza, what's your... What, what's your? I, I have two wishes, one for all of us and one for each one of us. Uh, for all of us, uh, I hope that uh, we begin to recognize how much more connected we are as a whole than we act or behave. 
I think COVID taught, uh, tried to teach us that. I hope that we've learned maximum on that. And the second one for each one of us is that uh, these, this disruptive period that we're going through gives each one of us an incredible opportunity uh, for inside out change personally. And, uh, and my wish for myself is that I take full advantage of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Lovegrove, what's your idea? Yeah, just the disruptive disruption is something both uh, that we create and the, to which we have to respond. And um, our ability to respond uh, will be tested um, as it has over the last 18 months, as it will be again by challenges from uh, further technological development and from forces like climate change and um, the real uh, uncertainty 